All right, if you all take your seats here, we'll get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to all those that are in attendance here at the Command and General Staff College, and for those that are watching via the DL Learning Systems, uh, to this third presentation for academic year 2022 of the Command and General Staff School and the Command and Staff, General Staff College Foundation's co-sponsored interagency brown bag lecture series. For those of you that I don't know, my name is Rod Cox. I'm with the Command and General Staff College Foundation. And on behalf of my partners, the Command and General Staff School, Colonel Tommy Cardoni and Mr. Marv Nichols, it's our pleasure to present this series of designed to enhance your interagency awareness and education. This lecture series is made possible by our sponsors, um, first from the Pro Foundation and then the folks from First Command. And I don't know if any of them are in attendance here. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We appreciate the support. We couldn't do events like this without supporters, so we thank you. I want to just make a note that I just came from a uh, wonderful dedication ceremony. Uh, we dedicated part of the atrium here in the Lewis and Clark building to uh, Lieutenant General and Mrs. Robert Arder. Um, and I invite all of you, when you get a chance to come into the building, to stop by, look at their portrait, and read about the extraordinary contributions that they've made in service to our country. So what a wonderful couple, and it's great that the uh, college recognized them here by naming the Arter Atrium of the Lewis and Clark Building. Our next brown bag in this series is scheduled for January the 20th. That's a Thursday. We're not going to present one in the month of December, but 20 January, so mark your calendars if you would. We'll be discussing the U.S. government's senior executive service. Um, and we should be back in our regular venue at that time, back upstairs in the Arnold Conference Room, but at the same time, 1230 to 130. And this will be a good opportunity for you to learn something about a core of senior leaders that's often overlooked when we're discussing interagency service and operations. So I hope you'll plan to join us then. All right, today's presentation, as I mentioned, will be recorded for use by the distance learning students, as well as being streamed live now, as well as for IA practitioners around the world on my commercial website. So what that means for you, those of you that are either outstation to ask or those of you here in the room, if you do have a question and want to engage in the dialogue, I ask you to please use the microphones there so that everybody can hear you as well as can be picked up on the recording. All right, to business. In the often confusing and sometimes shadowy world of the intelligence community, the least understood, I would argue, of our intelligence organizations is the Defense Intelligence Agency. The DIA operates in support of the warfighter as well as in support of policymakers. It operates both overtly with its core of defense attaches as well as covertly conducting operations in support of U.S. interests around the world. The DIA is our nation's premier all-source military intelligence organization providing authoritative assessments of foreign military intentions and capabilities. Our presenter today will be discuss the DIA, its mission, its roles in national security, and how you might work with them operationally, both downrange and here in the states. Mr. Roderick Jackson is the Defense Intelligence Chair here at the U.S. Army Command General Staff College and the DIA representative to the Combined Arms Center in Army University. He has over 30 years of experience in national security affairs with more than 20 years working with the DIA both in uniform and as a civilian employee. Among his many assignments and deployments, he has served as a defense attache and as a policy advisor to AFRICOM, CENTCOM, and UCOM leaders. He holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the United States Military Academy at West Point and master's degrees in international relations, international business, and strategic intelligence. He is conversant in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Please welcome Mr. Roe Jackson. All right, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and thank you for being here. This is, a, this is a, actually normally a great time to um, take a break from lunch and learn something important, hopefully. So uh, I, have a, I have a mission today. Next slide, please. Well, mission one is not to talk too fast and to talk clearly. I also add sometimes don't make too many um mistakes. Uh, we're going to take a look at my organization, and I'm really going to relate to the organization, kind of my, my, my lived experience in many cases. I'm going to follow loosely this outline here. What I would tell you, if you have questions while we're going through this, please ask. 
it may be better to answer a question just than to listen to me ramble about some of the things I think about. Really important on this slide is that, you know, if you go back to my agency, I talked about this, and I didn't like what Ro Jackson said, they'd probably say, well, it's not our official position. So you need to understand it's not necessarily the, my organization's official position. A lot of this is my lived experience. So that's what you'll get from me today. Um, I do much better with questions, so ask questions at the end or ask them in between, and I'll stop and try and address those. Next slide, please. All right, so the first slide I'd like to, slide, like to show is our organization, the intelligence community. 18 members of this community. If you count around that circle, and I kind of do that every once in a while, there's only 17 folks around. Well, who, which is the 18th agency? It's in the middle. It's the Office of the National Director of Intelligence. Honestly, I think he, it, that organization is much more than the agency. It's like an anchor. It's a guide. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a catalyst, if you will, and an advocate for the intelligence programs that we have. The NIP, the National Intelligence Program, and the MIP, the Military Intelligence Programs, the two programs that really constitute how we get at intelligence with our country. Everything that we do is kind of through this agency or through the vision of the policy that this agency helps create. And that everything we do is really, really run major purpose, is to support the major decision maker in our country, the president, and his ability to take care of our nation. That's what it's all about. So we have really, really one big boss and really, really one big boss in the middle that's helping to get the ship rolling in the right direction to hopefully help us produce the type of intelligence that will keep us as America safe. Next slide, please. All right, so can't have a briefing without a director. So our director, Lieutenant General Barrier, Barrier has been there since, been in our in charge since 20, Jan, 20 July 19, 2020. So he's got, a, he's got a year and a half now. So like all leaders, he's into making his stamp on organization. I'll show you some of that as we go through. Um, just suffice to say, he's, he really hasn't drastically changed things, but he's actually tried to improve, like all good leaders do. Next slide, please. OK, our mission. So I'm going to let you read through the mission. I want to emphasize several different things. One is. Our, the core parts of our mission, prevent strategic surprise. We don't want to have Pearl Harbors happen on our watch. And the other thing is provide decision advantage to our leaders, our decision makers, our policy makers, our military leaders, all those folks. That decision advantage gives them the opportunity to get past this OODA loop, or if you will, and to be able to make the right type choices with respect to policy to defeat our enemies sometimes even before they can realize they're getting defeated. But it's the given that advantage. And the bedrock that allows the DIA to do this is really our dominance of all intelligence related to foreign militaries. As our charge, not anyone else's, to understand the most about foreign intelligence threats, foreign, intelligence, foreign militaries, and how they can affect US interests. And to do that allows us to go back to prevent this, help support preventing strategic surprise and provide the type of decision advantage our leaders need so they can make the right type of decisions. The bottom of that slide, you kind of see DIA, kind of how we got started. Cuban Missile Crisis is really what put us on the map. Uh, in the 80s, we produced a document called Soviet Military Power. If you look at the DIA website, if you can go, it's, we actually have what we call Russian military power, or Russian power today, as well as Chinese military power. Two documents that are very important in the great, comp great power competition game that we find ourselves in today, and it really keeps DIA in the center of things and trying to help give some strategic thought and tr strategic vision towards what these adversaries are trying to accomplish as we move deeper into this competition and into the future. Of course, um, DIA is, you can't think of defense without DIA or without intelligence, frankly, because everything that uh, an operational force does is predicated on some type of information, if you will. Uh, we call it intelligence to ensure that they are going in the right direction and they can get their mission accomplished. Next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned General Barrier and, his, and him trying to put his imprint on our organization. And I, I decided to put this slide in because what it represents to me is the by, with, and through. I said, no, by, with, and through. So I, I remember learning this concept, and it 
really cost me some gray hairs. But when I think about our organization, I think it works pretty good. So if you think about the authorities, you think about the authorities that we're given. So um, go back to the, the first slide or so with the ODNI. All these authorities, this policy that comes out, and how we use that policy to shape what we do. And, and, and so that's the by piece, uh, the, the, the limits, if you will. And then the through piece becomes, if you see the adaptive, adaptive, adaptive uh, workforce, we have the right types of people. If you have a specialty, you can work at DIA. But we have adaptive people. We have people who, are, who can change and adjust. Uh, and we use technology because you just can't escape it. Whether it's crypto stuff or it's you know, fishing, we have to be appraised of that and, and understand how to defeat that. And then there's our partners. Back in the day, we used to think that we could do it all. And if you're, you Army folks put it all on my shoulders, I remember my boss says, you need to take as much responsibility as you can and not sink. Well, we realized somewhere in our, in our trajectory of our military over the last 20, 30 years is that we can't do it all and we need our partners. So our partners is another part of this whole through process using those process. And then the with piece is that our structures, and we'll talk about a little bit more, our directorates, our professional folks, our ability and desire to ensure that we are prioritizing and creating the right type of intelligence products and producing those in a discoverable manner worldwide to ensure that hey, the right information produced, the right people get information when they need it, and they don't have to look for it all day and all night. So those structures that we have in place, so it's the by, with, and through that allows us to execute the right type of missions, the right type of intelligence operations, and to go back to this mission at the beginning of providing strategic, I mean, excuse me, decision advantage and avoiding strategic surprise. Next slide, please. Okay, so just digging a little deeper, uh, our directorates in the blue there, there are four of them. I think I probably mentioned the structure. This kind of gives structure, and if you think about the directors, sometimes I think of force commas, force providers. So the directors are the folks who create the policy and some of the direct directives to ensure that we have the right folks who can go out and operate in those different fields. I'll talk a little bit more about the directors. But if you think about it as a force provider, they actually provide the right type of folks to go work in the centers on the left. And we have these centers which kind of brings together collectors, um, people who do logistics and training, uh, operations, all types of things to make sure that in the Americas, you don't have to go anywhere outside of your little rubric to find the type of folks support you need. For example, I'm in the Americas branch and I want to go collect on somebody who's doing something. Columbia, I want to collect on drug, drug trade. And so I don't have to go and find the collectors in the collector shop that are congregated on the other side of the DIA headquarters. I have them right in my, my organization. And I can leverage those to get the right requirements down, down range so I can get the right information so I can produce finished intelligence that again impacts this whole mission. Next slide. Okay, so at this point, I just want to show you some of the things that keeps the boss and all of us busy. There is nothing on this slide that's new to you all. So I've had the opportunity to brief the boss, uh, previous directors, before they go to Congress, and these are the things they're interested in. You have to, we have to make sure that they understand uh, what the agency is doing with respect to these issues so they can go and talk to Congress and fight for all the type of things that directors go and fight for con uh, Congress with, whether it's funding, it's authorities, all types of things. So nothing new, but everything we do, if you think of it, is framed around these types of issues and meld it back to the, the purpose of preventing strategic surprise, excuse me, preventing the strategic surprise and uh, giving our leaders decision advantage. Next slide. All right, so I only want you to take a look at a couple things on this slide. I mean, you can read through it if you like. On the bottom right is our directors. So just to emphasize that, the four different directors, I actually worked in all of those except for science and technology. In the, in the next few slides, I'll talk about my experience. I'll let you read the slides talk about my experience in those different areas. But the one thing, that one or two takeaways is we are a heavy civilian organization. 
It's led by a military leader. It's always been led by a military leader. But there are a tremendous amount of civilians in our ranks, about 75, 25. But what I tell you is that almost every directorate, every division is either, is, is really seconded by some military person. Many divisions are actually led by military folks. The directorates pretty, pretty much are led by civilians. But there's a tremendous amount of military folks who are in the structure, again, to provide that, that relative day-to-day -to -day touch to ensure that our decisions are relevant to what the operational force needs. And again, getting back to the supporting that mission. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, analysis. So when I think of analysis, I think of this is the tip of the pointy spear that most people see when you hear talk speak about intelligence. So you don't think about the collector. Well, sometimes the collector's operators, but you think about this analyst speaking truth to power, this famous saying, speak truth to power. You think about the analyst going before Congress or, or going to speak to policymakers, whether I've talked to diplomats, I've talked to, to uh, Congress folks, I've talked to uh, other policy, the intelligence policymakers to try and explain a, some, some problem or actually help shape policy. We don't make policy, we don't create policy, we shape policy. But that's the, that is the focal point or the end point, if you will, of all of the intelligence collection, processing, a cycle, and I'll show that to you a little later. And I've done that, I spent about four years doing that in DC, and it was one of the greatest opportunities I've had in my whole life. And what I did get to work on, that's pretty textbook, is what we call a national intelligence estimate or NIE, and these, these products are the products that go and they sh create and help shape the midterm and try to shape the mid, support the uh, long-term policy of the United States with respect to a specific problem. I worked on one for, it, for in in Angola and also one in South Africa. And another thing that was really kind of neat as an analyst, I got to represent our country in France several times and in Portugal, and of course I got to speak French and Portuguese, so that's pretty cool. All right, next slide. Okay, operations. So my experience with operations is as a defense attache. I spent uh, some time in Angola, speaking Portuguese, and both of the Congos, the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Congo, uh, working in these areas, dealing with you know very interesting people in both in all all the cases, but. If you think about the, intelligence, the, the defense intelligence agent, this defense intelligence office, or the DATs and the DATs who run those, those folks are out there really collecting this intelligence, or collecting information, and actually transforming it into unfinished intelligence, if you will. It's extremely important because if you think about this NIE process, you think about producing intelligence, and I'll show you some of that later, it starts somewhere. One of the lines of effort for producing intelligence, it, or unfinished intelligence especially, starts with the defense attaché. And it's a very important element. Someone has to go out and collect information, someone has to put that information in a system, and one way it, get, it happens is through defense attaché. It's not just the defense attaché in operations, a huge part of it is counterintelligence. And the counterintelligence is focused, uh, focused towards trying to keep troops safe on the ground. And then there's the, the human portion, which is, is one of the jobs that are probably the most demanding and hard to get, I believe, is being a, a, a debriefer, which really going out and looking at folks uh, who have um, either defected or were caught behind enemy lines or somehow or another and trying to understand what they know, but teasing all those important lessons and, and experiences out of them. Next slide. Mission services. So I have worked in mission services two times. And when I, before I start talking about my experiences, when I think of mission services, I think of logistics. I think about, I, don't, I mean, I really go back to when I was a lieutenant and the, the, you know, the ash and trash, and we call it ash and trash and logistics, trains and all these things. But it's not necessarily that relegated to a logistics type position. That's, that's only a small part of it. It's kind of a, 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 a large collection of professionals that really go about running the agency and keeping it, it operate, keeping it going. And one of, those, one of those functions is just, for example, foreign disclosure. So I worked in 
mission services as a foreign disclosure program manager, and I was tasked with trying to revamp how foreign disclosure is, t is taught and how to get that out produced and um, down to different COCOMs so that they could teach it. And if you understand anything about foreign disclosure, it's super important. It's the bread and butter of, 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 which, of which we use and, or how we actually share intelligence with our partners uh, and we, how we collect intelligence and how we share it also with civilians, what's classified, what's not. And that's super, super important. Um, the other thing I've done in mission services is right now as a liaison to this school and to CAC headquarters. Uh, it's important for DIA to be part of the whole public face, showcases intelligence, and also ensure that its, its leaders and its students have opportunities to socialize with the different sister services and civilians, and so as they grow up through the ranks, they really are a well-rounded intelligence officer who can support a variety of missions and the responsibilities in our organization. Next slide, please. Okay, science and technology. This is the one directorate that I haven't worked in. And I tell this joke to people, it's not a joke, I just this experience to say, when I went to the National Intelligence University somewhere around 2009, 2010, they were actually really kind of developing or they'd gotten this, this directorate or this, this educational track going. And I said, you know, what is, what is science and technology? I really didn't think about it besides, well, this is pretty cool, but today you just can't get away from science and technology. Again, I mentioned the crypto, it's the crypto, the, the phishing of whatever people are trying to do to steal something from you. Um, you got to, got to understand some of this technology. So I'll let you, if you're reading, if you read the kind of little blurb on the right about the career field, I talk a little bit about it. But one of the things we have to do is, is use the science and technology to protect ourselves protect DIA infrastructure, communications infrastructure, because in the intel business, if you can't communicate, you can't do anything. You know, it's great to have foreign disclosure policy, but you have to be able to communicate this and communicate it in a secure manner. So it's important, and if you go work in some of the organizations, you've got to have places, you just can't put uh, our computer systems anywhere in this auditorium and use them, they have secure spaces. So understanding the science and technology and how to defeat that and prevent it from affecting our operations with communications is extremely important. The other part of this is operational. Our mission, as again, as an organization that looks at defense, is to dominate how foreign militaries use science and technology to defeat our operations. So they're very important in an aspect of that is having our, our folks who work in this directorate uh, understand the military, go out and experiment uh, and figure out what they're doing and how to defeat it. And I'd say that the, the third thing, which really is a feed off the others, is that understanding what the enemy can do, the capabilities, if you will, allows our analysts to produce intelligence that supports all the planning process and ensures that we have better success with our mission that I've been quoting a couple of times and that we support our warfighters who are operating in the field. Next slide. Okay, so this is the part of the brief that I like the most because it, it resonates more with me and perhaps it'll resonate with you a little bit. So I like to talk about DIA from three different levels. And I, I do that because when I first came back to the Army and started working, people asked me the question, well, what does DIA do for the Army? And I, I, I scratched my head and I said, well, what do we do for the Army? Well, we do lots of things. Well, what are those things? So for me, it's all at the strategic level. So I had to kind of think about the strategic level and really deconstruct that to try and make something that's relevant for us today when we sit here as Army folks going through this great school. So DIA operates perhaps you can consider three different levels. First is National Capital Region. And I kind of talked about the analysts. The analysts, I believe, is really the is really the kind of the poster child for our agency. So the analysts is out there doing these great things in terms of producing this intelligence, influencing, influencing stakeholders, shaping policy, and trying to ensure that all this results in policy that gives us that decision advantage and prevents strategic bias. We have folks doing enterprise level type operations. I mentioned foreign disclosure, um, ISR. I tell this joke. I say, when I 
When I got to AFRICOM in 2015, people talked to me about ISR, and so I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember ISR. So this is, I was in an analyst hole before that. ISR, so, hmm, ranger school. We go out, we walk all night, we get lost, we dehydrated, we sit on some objective, we either attack that objective or we write something about it. It's like, no, it's ISR, it's overhead. The whole process is, although ISR people walk around is important, but no commander does anything without overhead ISR. You just wouldn't think about it, not today. So manage those assets, who gets those assets? You know, think about how important the Middle East has been over the last 20 years. Uh, what about Africa? Do they get any? How do you do this? How do you work with partners? How do you manage this? How do you process the information that comes from these, uh, this, these, uh, these platforms? You may sit somewhere looking at something for four hours and only have like 10, 15 minutes of, of data. Well, can we do it because it's overflow, because you get data from all over the place, or you're overwhelmed? How do you do that? And so our organization, our agency's correction, is actually involved with trying to figure out some of those questions. The acquisition in the future, the different front, you know, platforms, all these different things. One of the things I enjoyed the most throughout my career is working in J2. So a long time ago, I was a logistician. I'm like, I want to go work on the joint staff and, and go through this whole process of just on time fixing problems. Well, one day my boss said, you're going to go work for the J2 Watch, the most fascinating thing I've ever done. Sitting in the, in the J2 at 2 o'clock in the morning watching the screen light up with all these reports from different places across Africa and then writing about it. And not just writing about it, but writing and, and giving it to the J2 or going in his book and, and understand that you were doing something that was perhaps actionable. You know, the J2 got it and he would, could give it to the chairman or he could use it for something else. Hopefully not, you know, in a corner, but just an excellent opportunity to develop and, and really be part of national, the national security process in our country. So lots of different things. And the last thing I'll talk about for the national capital region is this whole thing about dynamic threat assessment. DIA is responsible for some, a product called a dynamic threat, threat assessment. You'll see this again, and I'll try not to talk about it too long. What that means is, what that product does is it talks about the operational environment before, during, and after operations. And it's something that's continuously updated because it helps the whole process of the planning process, which ultimately affects the person who's down in the foxhole, in theory. Okay, COCOMs. So really pinpointing a little bit more of this question, what does the idea do for the Army? I kind of say, well, if you go work at the COCOM, the COCOM is literally the confluence of the DIA and services. That's all the services, including Army. The J-2 operations centers are dominated by DIA personnel. Again, if we think about Forcecom, DIA is a force provider and it provides folks to go work in these organizations. Not to say that there's a bunch of military running them, but in most, ca most cases, the different divisions are run by military leaders, but everything else is pretty much minus about a, a little mix. You have a ton of DIA civilians running these organizations. The senior analytic um, officer responsible in COCOMs for production is, a, is normally a DIA senior. The deputy, not always the deputy, but the, one of the, the assistant J2s are normally DIA seniors. And so DIA is the cultures in planet, the trade crafts in planet, the structure of planet, the products are in planet or impregnated with DIA ism, if you will. So everything the Army guy does, the Air Force guy that does, he does it because he's influenced by DIA and there's this mel melding of, of thought and production and influence, if you will. Um, the other thing I just want to say about the, the, the COCOM J2 is, is that um, it really is a perfect match for the COCOM. If you got a J3, you got a J23, all these things are designed to be seamless, and all these things, for the most part, as I said, are actually executed, the responsibility is executed by DIA personnel. So DIA is all over the COCOMs. DIA is actually working with the military uh, to include the Army and trying to shape that whole process because at the COCOMs, from there you really get this whole part 
of intelligence support going down to the operational environment through JTFs, uh, and then you have the coordination of intelligence shortages, if you will, and I'll call those things that need to happen that can't happen because there's not enough assets. And those problems, if you will, or desires are, are, are coordinated through the J2 back on their way to DC. And the fulfillment of some of those deltas, if you will, happens through what we call national intelligence support teams or NIST teams that actually can go down to the foxhole, literally, if they had to, probably won't say them at the foxhole, and help fix problems, systemic problems, emerging problems, doesn't matter. So we are tasked to do that as a combat support agency, and we can get it done. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it would be only DIA going down. It would, it would be whatever the different intelligence disciplines we need to help support solving some problem. All right, the last area. Operation environment. So operational environment is where you find defense attaches. You find other collectors down there. You'll find the task force down there. So one day I was at AFRICOM and I sat around, it was actually it was not one day, but preparing for a task force to go down range and work in some kind of place. Uh, anybody ever heard of Camp Limonier? Okay. So they have a task force. So DIA's task actually to provide sustained uh, support for analysts. So you'll have a DIA going down range, several DIA analysts going down range to work in, task, in that task force all the time so that we can, one is bring intelligence from the, our agency or intelligence discipline or intelligence input uh, or just competent operators. Not to say that they're not competent already, but if you call, Le Monde has a rotation of about six month shelf life. And so Having folks who've been looking at a particular problem set over time is good to come down and be part of that. So you'll find us all over the place, but task force are really one of those things that are pretty important. And so they're constantly planning for these. And if you plan a task force at the operational level, you have to include the intelligence component. That intelligence component will come from the COCOM, and most likely it will be a military, per, excuse me, it'll be a civilian if it's DI, it's a civilian if they have them. Uh, and then at times, uh, or a mix between civilians and, and, and military folks. But civilians will likely be a part of those task force. Um, the thing I like to talk about when I go down to the operation environment is how you all will interact with defense attaches or security corporation officers sometimes, but defense attaches really work for the DIA, so we'll start with those guys. And normally they're the senior defense representative commissioned by the Secretary of Defense to represent uh, him and a host nation with respect to all of the op military operations. And he or she is in charge of trying to coordinate that unless it's a wartime thing when the COCOM commander is, is at his highest peak and he's really or she is really doing their thing. So you'd see them if you're going to do some type of exercise, if you're doing some type of planning, delivering some type of support in terms of really it's a functional support or delivering uh, weapons or arms or anything like that, you would have to go through the defense attaché. Defense attaché is a, a natural conduit for information. Information that he collects normally goes into the system and it's discoverable. And we'll talk a little bit about that, I think, if we have time. Next slide. Okay, so quickly I'm going to try and go through this. So I talked about big picture DIA and how we do things. Well, it all boils down to this kind of cycle. I like to tell people it's like a thesis, you may not agree, and that's okay, but you have folks telling us about what they want to do, plan, I mean, the policy, directives, and we have to create questions out of that. We take those questions and we go through this process and you have the collection process across the, across the defense uh, enterprise. Intelligence is federated, so it's not just DIA is going out collecting, it's DIA, it's Army, it's Air Force, it's all these folks, and they get little pieces of the pot. And so it's federated, people are collecting, and people are using a different platforms to collect. We talked about ISR, was my big joke, because I didn't know what it was until I got to, got to AFRICOM. And that is collected, processed. I mentioned the example, hey, you can sit there for four hours looking at something, but only have 15 minutes of good data. So you can't just take it all, it's processed, it's analyzed, and that's where you have the wreck, and then somebody writes something. Most important part is dissemination, and that dissemination 
means uh, speaking truth to power, maybe, which I think is the best way to do it if you have the opportunity to go and explain your product, to talk about your product, and really help impact policy. Not write it, not make it, but shape it. Uh, and believe me, you, you really make a difference because uh, you help open up the aperture from just having one set of information to multiple sets of information, and it makes policymakers uh, more valuable when they make determinations. All right, next slide. And one other thing about the other slide is that all of the intelligence disciplines, all of the directors are involved somehow or another in that whole production of intelligence. Okay, so we talked about the NIAs earlier, and so I wanted to kind of show you this. This brings us kind of back to the original slide with the 18 members, and in the middle was the ODNI. I said, well, ODNI is much more than just an agency. It's, it's just this guiding rock or anchor, if you will. So when you write one of these products called NIE, the National Intelligence Assessment, it's a national thing. And so the person who really is in charge of this and guiding this to, to a large extent is the ODNI. So each agency, if you look at this kind of square here, I guess it's a square, you have each agency is going through their little process, figuring out what to collect, when to collect, where to collect, producing finished intelligence to like address questions or comments or the input from the left uh, that really affect national level security, if you're national security, but at the national level, questions that, uh, that are really out there bothering folks, which shoot towards the mid to long term. And then at the other side, you get the inputs. But going through this is like a gearing process, and ODI and I is, is, in, is responsible for harmonizing, uh, uh, reducing conflict, making sure everyone has oppor opportunities to voice dissent, to voice dissent, and ensuring that a product that's produced that is acceptable and will have a lasting impact on national security planning. So that's kind of how we work together when we bring it all together. So we have a, a dual role. Combat support agency, which really squarely puts us almost down to the foxhole or in the foxhole. And we have a national role, which supports national security planning and intelligent production to ensure that we're all safe every day. And that's what we get when we go back to the big square. All right, next slide, please. All right, I have three slides, quickly. So if you think about down in the foxhole, think about, and think about the national intelligence, go to the right side here. You see these folks on the right here? They're all constantly working to produce this national intelligence support plan, to produce these plans that are constantly under revision. And those plans are produced, and they support all the planning, the operational planning. So at some point, whether you are at the COCOM level or the operational environment or task force or literally down at Foxhole, the things that the national intelligence enterprise, the international intel, intelligence community, and definitely to a large extent DIA, are helping influence those plans. So you're not going to shoot anybody or close with or destroy anybody without a tremendous amount of intelligence helping shape those operations. So that's, that's kind of what we do for you. We, we do it for you whether it's at the national level and the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, staff is, produce, is preaching some, some policy direction. We do it at the COCOM level because the COCOM man is not going to do anything without intelligence support. And we do it at the operational, excuse me, in the operational environment when you're down the task force or you're down as a maneuver element, even down to your foxhole and you orient your weapon to the left instead of the right because someone's told you that's where the enemy's coming from. And that, that influence tracks all the way back to the top. Next slide, please. All right, we mentioned the dynamic threat assessment. I don't want to really mention again too much besides it's before, during, and after. And it's all feeding this process of planning and helping the operational commanders get the right plans down to you. So again, you can turn left to right uh, eventually. Now, it's all filtered, so you may not get this big piece that says, well, there's 100 pages, so this is what a threat looks like, but you get the piece that you need so that you can execute your operation. Next slide. All right, last slide. Okay. So if you think about, you can read through some of this. You'll see the levels on the, on the left, and then some of the things I've done. This is a slide I put together a long time ago. But think about the defense intelligence, the defense attache, as one line of collection effort. So if you go back to the, the big square or even DIA, the, the cycle, there's 
there's planning, there's guidance, there's documents, the documentation says this is what you should be collecting, there's dynamic, you know, requests for information, then you as a collector are out there collecting. You collect this piece of information, it is unfinished intelligence, and you place it in a system that's discoverable. It's discoverable by your ambassador if he wants to see it or she wants to see it. It's discovered at the COCOM level where analysts use this information to write reports. It's discovered at the national level where analysts are there putting together these products, working on NIEs, and speaking truth to power. All starting, germinating from the, the folk, the guy who's down on the ground and the folks who are down on the ground as defense attaches or other collectors putting that information in. So you got the defense attache, you have ISR, you have Air Force, Navy, you have, you have um, after action reports, all these things supporting this process to bring this information back to the top to influence planning, those national intelligence support plans, to influence operational planning, and bring it back down to the foxhole, helping ensure that that soldier, young soldier that you are entrusted to take care of is oriented in the right position. I love it. Let's see what we got next. I think that's it. Okay, questions. Hey, Ro, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So as a defense attache, I'm interested, you're reporting to, obviously, back to DIA. Uh, you are reporting in some way to the combatant command and you're reporting to the chief of mission. And those three entities may have different priorities and perspectives and asks of you. Can you talk about how you manage those? Can Thanks. you go back one slide, please? This is a great question. And I didn't talk about it because, you know, I talk a lot. Okay, so you see that data execution there? So it, it talks about um, your question. And so you have multiple bosses. You got all these responsibilities, and you're trying to really produce some intelligence, or excuse me, some unfinished intelligence that people can use. Or you're trying to support some, um, some security corporation project. Or you're trying to do what the ambassador wants you to do. For example, my ambassador wanted to have a ship visit in, in Angola, and I thought it was ridiculous, but that's what he wanted. Um, so I'm trying to balance all these balls. I had a mentor who told me, he said, look, there are lots of balls to balance, and you're out there as a defense attache just juggling. And the real deal is that you are trying to figure out which one's the most important, and you're hoping that if you drop one or two of these balls, they're not the most important ball. Okay. So it's, a, it's kind of a revolving process of understanding your environment, understanding what the priorities are, understanding who's the most influential boss you have right at that moment. Because, oh, by the way, you actually have a letter from the, the Secretary of Defense saying you are, you are important. But if you cross the ambassador, <laughs> you may not have a home. So it, it really takes a, dipl a, a diplomatic approach to trying to optimize solutions for everybody involved. And it's a constant, it's a constant thing, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's just a constant juggle. Please. So the, the dots I was trying to connect, Tom Gray, SMDC, space, space question. Go space. So I, I, the dots I was connecting was between strategic surprise, making sure to get that to decision makers, which includes the war fighters. So the, my question is, is, as I saw on the COCOM list, I didn't see a DIA rep there in, the, in space comm. So with that, where is the DIA in the intelligence loop with regard to the Russian ASAT that happened on Sunday? Well, that's a good question, but I, I can't tell you specifically about But If you go back about second, third slide, we can shed some light on this, I believe, maybe. We'll see. So, I mean, so interesting enough, several months ago, I was posed with a question about space. And so sometimes I puzzle with these questions and, 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 and it wasn't nothing, nothing related to my great colleague there, but um, someone was trying to find out some things about space. And I said, well, space, the final frontier. And started thinking, come, 
advance, advance, please. Right there, stop. And, uh, and so, so what I discovered is, is that, again, as we think about dominating intelligence on foreign enemies, foreign adversaries, how do we do that? Well, we do it a couple of different ways. And as I mentioned, it's federated. So it's not that everything you'll find is at DIA. But if you look at the MISIC, is it MISIC? Yeah, is it, um, yeah, MISIC. Missile and Space Intelligence Center. That's one part of the solution is trying to, is mining that organization for information. That the, with the, uh, the analysis that they provide or the reports that they provide to support analysis and support operations, or counter operations, if you will, um, that's an important element. The other element, which is very interesting, is that when I was in this search because I was trying to help someone do something, I realized that at, Fort, at Wright Patterson, Wright Patterson is like significantly into this type of you know, space operations and missile launches and things like that. And so, whereas it is not directly, this is DIA. DIA is linked to all these different organizations. So what DIA's task is, as I mentioned, federated. All these federated different organizations provide information or intelligence to DIA because at the end of the day, the person who sits in Congress or the person who sits and says, hey, this is how it works, this is the problem, is some rep from DIA. It's either the director has to go to Congress or the director, has a director or his deputy or someone has to go represent DIA with the Secretary of Defense at some deputies or principals meeting, uh, but, it's, but it, that intelligence is tasked out, the request, and the information is collected, collated, analyzed, and then it's briefed by some DIA senior. Because at the end of the day, if it's about defense and supporting some plan, it normally it has to. The, the, the executive agent for defense intelligence is DIA at the end of the day. So that's probably the best way I can answer that question. Next. Gotcha. W would you comment on how a field grade officer might become an attache or get an assignment to DIA? So there are several different reasons. So it dep actually it depends on the service. And I'll start with a joke about myself or some point about myself. So I think it, I mean, I asked to become a D uh, defense attache or actually do something with um, foreign area officer studies about three or four times. And uh, I was told, I don't know if I was told anything. Finally, probably I was a ma I, young major, was I major? Yeah, young major, mid-grade major, and there was a realignment, and they said, welcome to the foreign area officer field. And I said, okay, so you're sending me to Latin America because I speak Spanish, you know, high-level Spanish, travel all over the place. No, you're going to Africa. So, of course, I said, where, where is Africa with a lot of non-explicatives? And um, they laughed at me and said, you shouldn't have done this, blah, blah, blah. So one is happenstance, you do it, you ask the question, hopefully you ask it at the right time. When I worked on the Army staff, we put together this process, or we really codified a process that you become a foreign area officer probably about six, seven, eight years, six, seven, eight, after, after, somewhere between your company command and before you probably come over here, right about, yeah, before you come over here, because many foreign area officers don't come to CGSC proper. They may take the four-month or the short course, you know, the extension course. And so that's, that's kind of the traditional way you get become a functional, it's a functional area, but really it's really a branch, but it's a functional area, and you do that for the rest of your career. I started in 1999, and I never stopped. I retired in 2012. So um, that's one. If you're Air Force or some of the other agencies, you pretty much can, you used to, you could, although they were working on these programs, I don't have the state of the art with the programs, but you pretty much could apply and become a, defense attache at several different points in your career, even at senior points. So there were, you know, 06s had never done this before, and they were going out to be attaches. Uh, I think I went to school, I think I went to language school 15,000 years ago, and as a lieutenant colonel, he was taking French, and he was going to go work in France at the missile, aerospace type organization in France someplace. Uh, and I thought that was pretty cool, but you can do it, it just depends. Does that answer the question? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Walker, 48 Echo. Uh, so I, a little insight into that now. For, for the Army, 
it's the VTIP process where you can come in at, at that time period that you described. Uh, there is a few opportunities for students coming out of here that they could possibly get in if they already have a master's degree in language and you're really interested. Uh, you can still have that possibility to get into it. Uh, the Navy has formalized their FAO program and it kind of mirrors the Army program now. Uh, the Marines still do the dual track, jumping back and forth between FAO assignments and their operational assignments. And uh, I want to say that the Air Force. Yeah, they do the dual track as well. Okay. Whereas in the past. Yeah, the Air Force does a dual track as well, and they've been in a major like revamp to make the uh, program better over the last uh, 15 years. I was in the initial cadre to be a FAO in the Air Force, and it's getting better, mm -hmm. put it that way. You guys still do the RAS in the past, right? No, we do not. Do the uh, so RAS became FAO, so we changed okay. the name, okay. and then th we still have PAS, but mm -hmm. it is not considered right. a FAO-specific mm -hmm. uh, career field. Uh, and just recently, uh, we just professionalized by taking all the fails and put them into a core flag, uh, which doesn't mean anything to most people, but it basically now makes us actually competitive in the same way the Army does, as, as that's our primary sort of functional area. But we are still pilots and navigators primarily. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you talk about the change 15 years ago, I think you said 15, and uh, so I was, I, I worked on Army staff 2000, about two years I guess, 2000, when I leave, 2009, so 2007, 2009. And so there's a lot of in engagement between the different services to try and streamline the programs and make them look a lot more like the Army program. And so uh, I guess some of that is continuing and it has paid dividends. Uh, but we, we got realigned in, in our functional areas and it allowed for the multiple, back then it was a multiple pass to success. And so you didn't have to, you got out of this whole S3 XO train to become a senior uh, military officer. Next question, please. Hey, Lieutenant Colonel Harvey, I'm a, I'm a foreign area officer as well, and I feel okay. somewhat obligated to, to add on to this because my previous job was at HRC as a failed career manager. Good. And especially for those field grades, Army specifically, that are in the audience that at some point might want to pursue a, a job as an attache. It is traditionally a, a failed job However, um, like Lieutenant Colonel Walker said, if, uh, if you have a language and a degree or any experience at some point in your careers, uh, post KD or whatever, um, it, there, there is a, a, a possibility to do an exception to policy. Mm -hmm. However, it's gonna be limited depending on areas that we need. And uh, I'll provide one specific example. I had a post battalion command Lieutenant Colonel um, who, who had a, a did Olmstead Scholar in Thailand, and that was exactly the, the skill set that we were looking for, and we were able to ETP the 21 year uh, in service, you know, active duty time, um, other branch into FAO in order to, to meet one of the requirements. Awesome. So it's not necessarily closed off, it mm -hmm. just is predominantly owned in the Army by foreign area officers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, I mean, I tell you, it was, I, I didn't anticipate getting selected, and I was uh, excited. Uh, I'd done branch Q time as a major. Um, the other, just to let you, as we talk about this just a little bit more, I, I recall when I worked on Army staff is we'd go up to West Point every year seemingly for some reason or another, but what we'd do is we'd brief all the um, language uh, instructors, and a lot of those folks had that uh, exceptional qualification of language and some experience, and so they were either trying to become fails or, or actually slightly become fails, but they got in because of an exception. So. Definitely there are opportunities and issues you have to pursue it. It took me three times. And you know, so it, it took me three times and finally it stuck. And I tell you, I just, um, you know, I, I tell the stories to some people that uh, I remember General Franks was going to Egypt one day. So I, when I was a fail working at, well, excuse me, working at CINCOM, I went back and forth to Egypt, Jordan every other month. And sometimes I did them both. I mean, it's just, sometimes General Franks would be in the air and he said, I'm going to Jordan, but I'm going to Egypt. And so I did, I had both portfolios, so I would work all night and uh, two days just trying to get all this right. Uh, but um, but the, the point is, is that um, I learned so much 
about how to do this business from all this, this, this effort. And I think it's definitely worth you pursuing it. I mean, the Army used to be be all you can be, you know, so, you know, I have definitely tried to work that to death. I was an air defender, a logistician, because I said, if I'm gonna stay in the Army, you can do something I like, and I'm like, I really wanna go work in embassies. So three times later, they say, you can go do it. So, it's all good. What's next, please? Sir, uh, Tim Bravo, Major Chu from Taiwan. So I have a question. You mentioned that uh, you, DIA uh, cooperate with, with different partner countries. And uh, my question is, if there's a, an, uh, some intelligence from uh, foreign countries, then who has the authority to uh, decide that in, uh, the intelligence to share with the other US intelligence agencies? So um, so we talked about foreign disclosures. Foreign disclosure talk it really kind of outlines who can share what, when they can share what, and how. And so if you go down to COCOM, COCOMs are intimately involved with reshaping, addressing, sharing requirements. So if there's not a sharing agreement uh, established with a, whole, with a host country, then between DIA and the whole, this whole enterprise, they work, the old enterprise elements work to establish some type of sharing relationship or to determine that there's one required or not required and they don't establish one. And once the relationship is established, then you can do all types of things with respect to sharing. For example, I mentioned I've traveled to France several different times and Portugal involved in exchanges where you can talk to uh, different um, analysts and figure out uh, what's right and what's wrong. You can check intelligence. Uh, you can actually learn some things so, and share some things. So that's kind of how it works. It's really someone has to start an agreement. And so COCOM is responsible for launching those. Um, DIA launches some of their own. Um, ultimately, they have to be approved at high levels in the national capital region. And if, once they're approved, then you can do lots of different things. And foreign disclosure becomes very important. I just want to finish. Just with this FAO thing, and then even really all of the great things you all are doing now, have done, and definitely will do, because at the strategic levels, uh, and eventually you'll get there, if you stay in the military long enough, you'll be doing some great things. So I started with this General Franks story, and so I got the CENTCOM, and they tell me, you're gonna work, um, you're gonna work uh, Jordan. They're gonna work Egypt and Jordan. Egypt first, and then they gave me Jordan. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's, it's kind of like a rite of passage. But General Franks is going to Egypt one day, and he was supposed to give a speech. And so a speech writer, I mean, they got speech writers. It's a right speech. Speech writer said, I'm not writing it. So I'm a young guy at CENTCOM, and so I'm like, whatever. So, you know, I write, we do books. You do trip books. You do policy briefs all the time. So I write this speech. I'm just writing, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new to this level. It took me a while to try and understand the difference between operational, excuse me, operational strategic levels. And it, and it was, and actually I remember joking and laughing, saying, oh yeah, now I can actually see the difference. But it's not something that, you know, we can train about it, but really you have to discover it through practice, I believe. So uh, I'm looking at the paper like Monday. And in the paper is parts of this speech. And they're basically direct quotes of, of what I wrote. I almost died. And what we're trying to do is advocate for Egypt to go to Afghanistan and do something. You know? And um, he used my speech. And Egypt went to Afghanistan. And so the things you do, the things you're going to do, they are important. And at the strategic level, it was huge. Because one is we give Egypt a lot of money, so we were able to show some benefit, bang for the benefit, bang for the buck. And then two is, we supported Afghan women uh, with Muslim or you know, with yeah, Muslim doctors, if you will, uh, versus someone else. So at the strategic level, you're going to do all types of incredible things. And what you do is important. And it really makes a difference because people can get killed if you don't do your job well. And I'll leave with that. If you have other questions, you saw the, I guess we had my information up there. And if you really are looking for me, you can find me on the fourth floor. Everybody knows who I am, I believe. And um, 
I think I'll call it quits with that. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. We appreciate that. Thanks. All right, once again, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Our next interagency brown bag lecture series presentation will be Thursday, 20th January. The topic will be the Senior Executive Service. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you.